Kore na e hoa ma, na mihi nui ki a koutou. Uh, I want to thank uh, Infrastructure New Zealand for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, I've really enjoyed over the last few years uh, being part of this uh, gathering, which is the premier uh, congregation of the infrastructure industry and associated sectors. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Chairman Andrew Stevens of Infrastructure New Zealand, uh, the outgoing uh, Chief Executive Stephen Selwood, and he is outgoing in so many ways, uh, and, and really just acknowledge the extraordinary contribution that Stephen has made uh, to this industry and to New Zealand through the, the quality uh, and the prolific advocacy um, that has come out of Infrastructure New Zealand over the last few years. And I want to uh, also acknowledge the new CE, Paul Blair, who I'm sure will do a stunning job. There's a lot going on in the infrastructure and urban growth space. And I want to update you this morning on a few key initiatives that we've got underway, like uh, urban rapid transit, our work on infrastructure funding and financing, uh, the reform of the planning rules, and the establishment of Kainga Order, our new housing and urban development agency. But mostly uh, today, I want to use my time with you to tell you about what I think is a tremendously exciting uh, development in our approach to urban development. And that is the Hamilton to Auckland Corridor project. But before um, I do that, I want to address an issue that I know there's a lot of interest in. I've heard loud and clear from you all over the, re the recent years that we need to consider and be open to new funding and financing models to enable infrastructure projects to be delivered. This is especially important for large infrastructure projects. And one such project is Auckland Light Rail. Light rail will be a game changer for Auckland. It will be able to carry 11,000 commuters per hour, the equivalent of four lanes of motorway, but light rail is a median that can run through some of the most densely built up parts of the existing urban footprint. It will, alongside the city's mature motorway network, uh, be the backbone of the transport system that will give our country's biggest city the mobility and the access its citizens and its firms need to prosper. Now we have to make sure that this project is fit um, for generations to come and that's why we're taking the time to examine the different proposals we've received in detail and to get it right. NZ Infra, a joint venture between the New Zealand Super Fund and Canada's uh, CDPQ uh, Infra Group uh, and the New Zealand Transport Agency will further develop their proposals for government to consider over the next few months and into early next year. What NZ Infra is proposing has never been considered before in New Zealand. It's a kind of public-public investment model it includes co-designing the asset with the government and its partners, with the majority of financing and risk transferred to NZ Infra. Now there are significant differences in how the two options would be financed and delivered. NZTA is exploring a range of procurement, financing and delivery models, including alliances and PPPs, and will continue to develop these. Both options for delivering light rail are credible and compelling, but they need further work so that we can assess them fully. And that step is critical for the government if we're gonna make the right decision on how best to deliver light rail for Auckland. It will provide us with the certainty we need to progress this multi-billion dollar project which will transform Auckland. Now, I want to talk to you, uh, start really the frame for the discussion about uh, the Hamilton to Auckland Corridor project is really the performance of our cities. And I think we all know that our cities are performing uh, poorly.
Land prices are too high. Housing costs are rising. Productivity is flat. Traffic congestion is getting worse in large part due to decades of underinvestment in public transport. And the fact that the road networks on their own are inherently unable to deal with peak demand driven by population and economic growth. Income is not growing as it should. And the recent KPMG report that showed that household income uh, in Auckland over the last decade has fallen by $100 a week. That is a result of rising transport and housing costs. Now, uh, in our view, there are some key changes that are needed uh, in the way that we manage uh, urban growth. We think there are three key shifts that have to be made. First, we must make room for growth instead of trying to stop it all the time. We must remove the unnecessary constraints on urban expansion, both up and out, while protecting areas of special value. Secondly, we have to make growth pay for itself. We've got to find new mechanisms to fund and finance the infrastructure, and we've got to be rigorous and serious about identifying and allocating the true costs of growth. And third, we must invest in modern transport systems that give people and firms the mobility they need so that markets can work properly and cities can thrive. Now to deliver on this agenda, we have five streams of work that I just wanna to touch on. The first is infrastructure, funding and financing. Um, in order to enable a much more responsive supply of infrastructure through alternative financing approaches. And I'm pleased to say that over the last uh, year, I think we've made great progress on this and we'll have more to say very soon about our initiative to legislate and put in place a new framework that will allow private financing of urban infrastructure with the debt sitting on a special purpose vehicle balance sheet and serviced over the lifetime of the asset by a targeted rate on the properties that benefit from that infrastructure. The second work stream is urban planning. It's just my slides are just getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, the, the second um, uh, work stream is urban planning. And yesterday, David Parker and I announced a new national policy statement under the RMA on urban development, which would, once finalized, direct councils to make room for growth. It's a deliberate effort to change the culture and the direction of planning departments from one end of this country to the other, to move beyond the old paradigm of urban containment and recognize that unless we allow our cities to grow out, we'll never get a competitive urban land market. And if we don't allow our cities to grow up, if we stop people building and living in places where they wanna live, close to jobs and amenities and transport connections, if we ration floor space in that way, we simply drive up the price of housing. The national policy statement as well as uh, directing councils to take this new approach to growth, uh, also uh, will be uh, directing councils to take a spatial planning approach to actively plan for growth. The third stream is legislative reform and David Parker has a comprehensive uh, reform of the RMA system uh, underway. Transport pricing, which is uh, uh, one of the most important parts of this whole agenda, which offers us the potential not only to use demand management tools to manage the congestion peaks in our major cities, but also uh, to, to fully internalize the costs of transport in urban development. And finally, spatial planning. The need to move beyond the effects-based 
hands-off approach that's been the status quo under the, during the RMA era and to move towards a much more collaborative and holistic approach to managing, planning and investing for growth. So today I want to focus on uh, spatial planning. Um, uh, it's a mechanism that's designed to make room for growth. It's one that works alongside all of the other interventions that I've mentioned that are part of the urban growth agenda. And uh, it has strong links to uh, the creation of Kainga Ora, the new housing and urban development agency. So one of the most exciting ways that we're building on this new approach is through six regional spatial planning uh, partnerships in Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch, and Queenstown. Central government has never partnered like this with councils and mana whenua. We're making 30-year growth plans that join up transport, housing, infrastructure, planning, land use and investment. Without the involvement of central government, key investment decisions are often made in an ad hoc way and strategic land use and transport decisions disconnected. What's more, land supply and intensification opportunities are often constrained by restrictive zoning. Now the most advanced of the, uh, the new spatial planning partnerships is the, that in the Hamilton uh, to Auckland corridor. Uh, it's a powerful corridor that exists around the mighty Waikato River, the main trunk line and the Waikato Expressway. And it has significant underused capacity. While at the same time we see powerful growth forces surging south out of Auckland and north out of Hamilton. Both the government and councils have, have received numerous proposals for innovative new transport projects uh, and urban development in the region. So we were motivated to try to bring them together and develop the thinking together in a fully integrated package. It has the potential to be the country's first interregional corridor-based growth plan. So you might be wondering why focus on Hamilton to Auckland? Well, I think there's a few strong reasons. The first is that in terms of size, volume and value, this is New Zealand's most significant inter-regional road and, and rail traffic corridor. It connects New Zealand's largest and fastest growing urban areas along a corridor with very high natural and cultural importance. It's facing uh, rapid population growth. In the high growth scenario, the population along this corridor is expected to increase by around 300,000 in the next 30 years. There is significant housing and employment growth uh, and potential in the Drury, Paidata, Pukekohe, Tuakau, Pokeno cluster in the north of the corridor, in Auckland's southern growth corridor, and in the Greater Hamilton area that stretches from Naru Wahia in the north to Cambridge, Te Oamutu, and Hamilton in the south. Now existing uh, corridor management issues such as congestion on the southern motorway and water discharge quality have wide-reaching impacts across the Upper North Island and put real limits on the growth potential unless they're addressed. The Southern Motorway is a huge challenge. It is a massive bottleneck that runs right through the part of the country that is experiencing the most powerful growth pressures. The work program has five key areas of focus. First is the river, which is of central importance to Waikato Tainui and the Tainui Waka Alliance, who have become very important partners in this project. And then there's also the work on water infrastructure. And the further you move south uh, from the Bombay Hills, it becomes very clear that three waters infrastructure is uh, a very significant constraint on urban growth and development. And I'm pleased to say that the councils uh, in, the, in the region are committed to working together 
to try to find a sustainable uh, solution to the, the problem that they've got with three waters infrastructure. The second uh, key focus is building stronger connections through the corridor. Uh, this time next year, the startup rail service between Hamilton and Auckland will be operating. And we are also well underway with a cabinet mandated initial business case for rapid intercity rail between Hamilton and Auckland. We're talking about 160 kilometre an hour tilt trains that would get you from Hamilton to the Britomart in an hour, effectively uniting these two labour markets. I now want to touch on the three uh, key geographic areas that make up the corridor. Auckland's southern growth corridor from Papakura south through Drury, taking in Pukekohe, and down into the northern Waikato towns of Pokino and Tuako, is experiencing some of the strongest growth pressures anywhere in the country. And with its access to electricity and water and proximity to the Golden Triangle, it's the part of Auckland that will inevitably accommodate much of the city's growth in coming decades. The strategic challenge is to deal with the bottleneck of the Southern Motorway. New development has to reduce car dependency, not exacerbate it. But I believe that the Southern Growth Corridor is ripe for the making room for growth approach. Protecting areas of special value for example, the Pukekohe growing soils, setting aside open spaces for future generations, acquiring land for network infrastructure, and then allowing people to develop as long as they can carry the costs of the infrastructure and services they need. We have to invest in the critical enabling transport infrastructure, like Mill Road, new rail stations at Drury, electrification to Pukekohe and onward to Pokeno and Tuako, and of course, the third and fourth li uh, main lines. The aim then is to allow people to develop. The next of the, of the, the uh, geographic areas is the river communities. Beautifully located between Pokeno and Topiri, are communities with great heritage and historic value. This is the heartland of Waikato Tainui. They need love and investment and development. And none of them have the topography to support large scale urban development, but with good planning that takes the community along uh, with the, on the journey, with love and investment, they have the potential to grow well. Now third is the Hamilton and well, Hamilton Waikato metropolitan area. And you might raise an eyebrow at the eyebrow at the description of Hamilton as a metropolitan area. But Hamilton has the potential to be even more of a thriving, high growth and affordable urban centre. It is incredibly well positioned between the port at Tauranga and Auckland with its huge labour market and international airport. It has superb road connections thanks to a decade of investment in the Waikato Expressway. And it services the richly productive Waikato heartland. And what's more, it has a vast amount of flat developable, developable land to grow into. And perhaps just as important or more important as, as all of those uh, economic and, and uh, geographic uh, assets. It has local government leaders, not only Hamilton City, but Waipa, Waikato District and Waikato Regional Councils, along with Waikato Tainui, who are, the, who are major asset owners, visionaries, investors and guardians, who are all ambitious for change and reform. And together, through this spatial planning process, we're exploring whether we can retrofit Hamilton's heavy rail network, which already serves the city, as well as radial corridors reaching out to Te Oamutu, Cambridge, Huntley, with a modern suburban rail service. If we do this, if we integrate 
modern rapid transit alongside the roads and motorways, we can set Hamilton up for generations to come with an integrated transport network that can accommodate uh, the kind of growth that this city is capable of delivering. Hamilton also has several candidates for large scale urban development projects. And we're discussing radical zoning reform that would lift height and density restrictions in the urban core and around the rapid transit network, as well as boldly extending urban zoning beside the rail line out into the surrounding countryside. This would dramatically increase the quantum of development opportunities and set Hamilton up to be New Zealand's first major urban centre with high growth and affordable urban land and housing. These principles, reforming the planning rules to allow the city to grow up and out, to jo joined up spatial planning that includes transport, they are at the heart of the draft national policy statement that David Parker and I released yesterday. So I want to conclude by saying that I think the Hamilton to Auckland corridor project has extraordinary promise. It's a new approach to partnership that is already enabling bold approaches to spatial planning, playing a key role in unlocking the full potential of transformative infrastructure and development work. You put it alongside our other initiatives, David Parker's comprehensive reform of the RMA, our new national policy statement on urban development, infrastructure financing and funding reforms, the establishment of Kainga Order, our new housing and urban development agency, with all the tools to undertake large scale and complex urban development projects and our commitment to ensuring that transport policy is fully integrated with these plans to develop our cities and regions. The six growth management and spatial planning partnerships, including, and especially, it's the most advanced uh, of the op six options so far, the Hamilton and Auckland Corridor, are an opportunity to finally turn around the urban dysfunction that is holding so many of our cities back. These partnerships are also an opportunity to model a new collaborative approach that I believe may help us to overcome some of the institutional misalignment problems that Infrastructure New Zealand's latest report points to. They foreshadow an end to the hands-off effects-based approach to planning under the Resource Management Act that has served our country so poorly. They offer the opportunity for us to put infrastructure and economic growth into a much bigger, better conversation with the community about well-being, about the natural environment, and about the legacy that we are leaving for future generations. And for all those reasons, these spatial planning partnerships may well demonstrate and develop an approach that could inform the bigger reform of the RMA, the Land Transport Management Act, and the Local Government Act. Thank you for having me along today. Let me again thank and acknowledge Infrastructure New Zealand for its thoughtful and challenging advocacy. Thank you. Minister, would you care to stay and just answer a couple of questions that are coming in from the floor, or are you dashing off to the airport? No? He's game for it. Thank you very much. Um, I know you've been talking about rail uh, between Hamilton and Auckland, but there's a question here about light rail. Um, how is light rail the solution to Auckland's transport needs when a business case hasn't been undertaken and previous reports concluded it wasn't the best option? Um, on the contrary. Actually, uh, successive uh, analysis and work done, starting with Auckland Transport, uh, uh, NZTA and, um, and Ministry of Transport, uh, have all concluded actually that for this part of the city, 
uh, from the CBD across the isthmus to this uh, job-rich airport precinct in the south. Uh, that, that is the missing link in the, the rapid transit network that we have to build. Successive reports and analysis by all of those public agencies concluded that actually light rail was the appropriate uh, mode. The thing about light rail is that uh, it has the capacity to shift uh, large numbers of people efficiently. I said 11,000 11, people an hour, the equivalent of four lanes of motorway, through parts of the city that are highly built up and, and highly developed. Uh, and that's the reason why there are, are currently five light rail projects uh, going on in Australia. It's why there are dozens and dozens of uh, light rail projects in cities around the world that are, like us, retrofitting uh, car-dependent 20th century cities with modern rapid transit uh, networks. So uh, the other critical thing about the Auckland Light Rail project is that it is, it is fundamentally about extending the rapid transit network alongside the northern busway that runs across the Harbour Bridge and up through the northern suburbs alongside the existing heavy rail network. We add uh, uh, light rail across the isthmus to the airport and hopefully out to the northwest growth area uh, alongside State Highway 16. We've then got a network that is sufficiently efficient at moving large numbers of people alongside the road and the motorway network and we, and we will finally uh, deliver for Auckland the possibility of uh, of deliverance from the chronic congestion uh, that is the inevitable result of a transport system that relies almost exclusively on roads and motorways. How likely are we to see Simon Bridges on Queen Street in his undies when you manage to start this before the next election? Look, I think this is a family audience. And, uh, <laughs> Don't worry, they've been exposed to it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so are we, we, we going to see it started before the election? Look, the uh, work will be underway. Um, the, I mentioned the, uh, the process that we've set up the Ministry of Transport working very closely with uh, both the NZ Infra Consortium uh, and uh, with NZTA's uh, option of a more conventional PPP or design and build option. Um, the process has been set up so that uh, all of that information will be ready to go to Cabinet early in the new year and that's when the decision will be made on which uh, delivery partner we go with. And so we'll be working as fast as we can uh, from that uh, to get the project underway. I'm not sure if that's a yes or a no, but we are out of time. We'd love to ask you more questions, but thank you very much for being here today. Please put your hands together for Phil Twyford. Thank you.